Hello and good morning from uh, me, Mike Smith, ECA Technical Director. So today is our fifth in the series of Technical Tuesday webinars. And today's topic is PoE or Power Over Ethernet. Something that has been around for quite some time, um, but with an increased capability may well be uh, more prominent in the future. I think absolutely will be. Luke Osborne is here today to take us through the presentation. If you have been on the uh, previous presentations, you will be aware that we actively encourage questions. So please ask away. Um, don't feel inhibited. Um, even if we don't know the answer, we'll find it. Um, just use the QA pane that um, you can open up and type in your question. Uh, we'll be in the background uh, with the technical team. We'll try and answer your questions as we go along. Or um, if we need to, we'll leave it to the end and we'll take five, ten minutes Q&A. So I'll hand you over to Luke and I'll speak to you later. So uh, good morning, Luke. Hi, Mike, and thanks for the introduction. Uh, yeah, as Mike said, my name's Luke Osborne <clears throat> and I'm the Energy and Emerging Technology Solutions Advisor here at ECA. Um, we're going to be looking at Power Over Ethernet, uh, POE, uh, and the exciting opportunities for the electrotechnical contractor. So a brief look at the agenda. Uh, we will be covering what is POE? Uh, is it a big deal? Uh, the evolution of Power Over Ethernet, um, look at some examples of usage, uh, potential growth going forward, and is it a pipe dream or reality? Uh, followed by a brief summary at the end. So, what is POE? Um, essentially, it's the delivery of uh, up to 57 volts DC separated extra low voltage self. Um, this is uh, this is delivered uh, by utilizing twisted pair cabling, um, your common uh, Cat5, Cat6 cables. Uh, and importantly, this enables simultaneous delivery of both power and control through a single cable. Uh, and uh, through the most recent standards, it's capable of delivering up to 90 watts um, to the end device. The output from the uh, from the PSE, the power sourcing equipment, is actually between 100 and 105 watts. So you can uh, deliver between 90 and 100 watts to the end device. So is this a big deal? Well, nearly everything in our modern lives runs on DC. Um, many things, um, for many things, this is internally converted from AC to DC. Um, examples are your televisions, your audio equipment uh, and in, and LED lighting uh, with, with the drivers uh, that, are, that are built into these. And then you've also got your wall warts, your three pin warmers uh, that are plugged into your 1363 sockets and also external AC to DC transformers. So these are common for your computers, your IT equipment and a whole plethora of chargers, your mobile phones, your tablets, and yeah, the, the whole world of gadgets that's around us. Video surveillance and security alarms are also uh, run on DC, and this is being converted from AC, the 230 volts AC, down to DC. So again, is this is PoE a big deal? How does this help? Well, in the current setup we just looked at, there's high conversion losses. You've got multiple instances of conversions going on. There's a lot of wasted resources with multiple uh, multiple charges, multiple transformers, uh, and also multiple points of failure with all these devices. But crucially, many of the devices that are being powered require less than 100 watts. So if you were able to move away from the endpoint AC to DC conversion, you'll save money, you'll save resources, and also there's an increased safety factor. There's low touch voltage, and there's no earth path. So back to the original question, what is power over Ethernet? Well, POE originally came around in uh, 2003 through the IEEE standard 802.3 AF, and this enabled the delivery of 15.4 watts of power, as well as uh, data communication between devices. Over the years, um, there's been uh, many improvements in the standards, and this has led to four types. Uh, so type one, type two, type three, type four, as you can see on the right hand side. And the current iteration, uh, IEEE 
802.3bt now enables up to 100 watts of power to be delivered to these devices. The original uh, two standards, AF and AT, uh, they called for power delivery from two of the four pairs. Um, but the, the most recent development, the 802BT, uh, this was approved in September eight, uh, 2018. And as well as enabling 100 watts of power to be delivered, um, it also enables data rates up to 10 GBase T, which is 10 gigabits per second. And this is up to uh, a range of 90 meters from the, the PSE, so the power sourcing equipment. Uh, we'll look at some examples soon. Um, it's best to use category 6A for these connections. Um, so over the, the four balanced twisted pair cabling, as uh, CAT 6A um, is best for thermal power and also th uh, power efficiency. Um, you have limitations of, uh, of uh, rising up to 10 degrees C for um, these sorts of cables. Uh, so these have a larger core size and a better at um, yeah, delivering the power uh, with less losses. So a look at the applications and how things have changed over the years. So when there was the original standard, the uh, 802.3 AF standard, um, supplying 15.4 watts, this enabled uh, VoIP, voice over internet protocol phones, um, static, simple uh, surveillance cameras, um, possibly with tilting function, uh, and also wireless access points that gave enough power to, to enable these to be connected and operated through power over Ethernet, the single cable. As the uh, as the standards increased, uh, type two up to, uh, I think this was 30 watts, this then enabled biometric sensors, things like fingerprint, voice, face, iris, iris recognition, also LCD displays to be connected. Uh, the, the power was such that uh, these could be connected, uh, data could be sent, and it enabled a simple solution for these. Uh, at the same time, um, yeah, this also enabled the more advanced cameras with increased functionalities, uh, tilt, zoom, etc. Um, and at the same time, LEDs came, uh, LED lighting came to the fore, and these proved really well um, as uh, really well suited for PoE applications. Uh, so you started to see these in, uh, add to the mix, and at the moment they they're the biggest drivers for uh, PoE applications uh, currently. And then once we get to type four, uh, the BT standard, 100 watts of delivery, that's now more than capable of powering most equipment. Um, the, the current 15-inch uh, MacBook Pro um, that has a type C uh, power supply supplied, which is 87 watts. And that, that's, a, that's um, yeah, a, a large computer, a powerful computer. And the 87 watts uh, delivered, that can be provided by PoE. And you can get, um, Convert, uh, converters to um, convert from the PoE to Type C charging devices, so you could see that how much this could enable the powering of devices in the future. There's just a few simple examples there. So we'll look at a typical setup here. Uh, you have the self transformer, uh, which supplies power to the PoE switch, um, otherwise known as the the PSE, the power sourcing equipment. Uh, and into this, you can have a whole array of different devices connected. An example here is just a simple data connection point, um, like you would have connected uh, to the Ethernet switch. Um, you expand that, you have the uh, PoE receiver, the, the end powered device. Um, so th this could include um, yeah, all, all your, your VoIP units, your cameras, uh, all the other devices that link into the, the PoE system. And then you can have examples of non-PoE receivers. Uh, so these, these could be devices that aren't PoE compliant, but by using a PoE module or a splitter, uh, the module can uh, provide power to the device, switched power. Uh, so an example could be a motorized blind or, or something similar, um, or simply providing power, as we saw in the previous example, to a computer, a, a, a charge point, uh, or any other mobile charging device. I mentioned earlier that uh, there were limitations on the distance of 90 meters uh, from the PSE uh, to the end device. Um, but to get over that, you can add in a PoE injector. Um, so this will um, this enables an increased distance to be attained uh, for the for the end 
usage device and this operates by injecting additional power into the into the cabling to bring the voltage uh, back up to the required spec for the devices. You can also uh, factor in uh, inline PoE surge protection devices. Now these operate in a complementary manner to other surge protection devices that will be already in the building. So they're not standalone, they're a complementary measure. And you could have lots of uh, important, expensive equipment connected into these things. So it is worth considering in those circumstances. So an example of a PoE receiver, here we're looking at uh, an example for lighting. Um, so it's important that the end device complies with uh, at least one of the um, 802.3 standards. Um, the, the BT standard is backward compatible. Um, needs to have at least one RJ45 port uh, so that they can be connected. Uh, and so you'd connect the, the powered device in this instance um, lighting. Uh, to the, the PSE, the power source equipment, uh, and then that can enable uh, the control of the lighting through whatever means. You've got an example here of a smartphone app uh, becoming very common with all the all the smart tech that's out there at the moment. Uh, and uh, it's important to note that whatever devices being connected do still comply with their relevant standards. An example here for lighting uh, still needs to comply with EN 60598-1 for luminaires. And now we'll look at the example of a non-POE receiver. Uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, you could have like motorized blinds, for example. So here we have an example. Uh, so you have the POE module on the splitter device um, located here. This is uh, item B. So you've got the POE connection coming in and that can uh, control, switch control, uh, the powering of whatever equipment's connected. Um, in this instance, the blind. It's important to ensure that um, the end equipment can run on the DC power supply, that the voltage is less than or equal to 57 volts DC, that the power is less than 90 watts, guaranteed delivered uh, uh, power. Um, and yeah, so the, the receiver can then be powered and controlled by the installation in PoE, um, and then the end device uh, connected downstream through the module and the splitter. And here we have an example of a module for multi-point control. For example, where you may have um, a, a gr multiple groups of, or a group of LED lighting uh, that need to run on common lighting ramp control. Um, so yeah, one device can then facilitate uh, the, the same setup for all these devices. And uh, finally, uh, one of the examples here we have of the, um, the connected Wi-Fi point. So the PoE uh, connected to, to the uh, powering a Wi-Fi point, uh, which is also enabling uh, a further PoE connection or a data connection and the USB charging point. I mean, the example here is USB A, but as I mentioned earlier, this could power up to USB C, uh, then enabling um, the removal of all these wall warts that we see around our offices and workplaces and homes. So how does it work? Um, PoE works by built-in power management uh, through the negotiation progress, uh, negotiation process. Uh, the PSE, the power sourcing equipment, tests whether there's something on the end of the line. Um, and once it finds the, uh, the PD, the power device, uh, it will then send power. Uh, enabling the power device to come to life. The power device then says to the powered sourcing equipment, hello mate, I'm a powered device. Uh, my maximum power is X. Please can you send me X amount of power? Uh, the PSE then responds in kind saying, well, congratulations, I'm a PSE. You may have X amount of power, please take my power. Uh, and the, P, uh, the powered device is then allowed whatever power is specified by the PSE. There's a couple of caveats. The powered device can never request more than its class of power. The powered device can never draw more power than is permitted by the uh, powered uh, by the PSC, uh, and the PSC cannot reduce the power allocated to the uh, PD. But the PD may request reduced power. So, is uh, is it pretty easy? Is it all uh, compatible? Um, it is very easy. It's, it's, it's connection wise. Fantastic. Unfortunately, it's a little bit of a VHS Betamax moment at the moment. 
yeah, it's very proprietary uh, with different manufacturers adopting different me methods, uh, which may all be labeled P uh, POE, um, but they may not be fully implementing the full function across a fleet of differing devices. Um, and yeah, there can be compatibility issues out there. Uh, to resolve this, the Ethernet Alliance has come together and uh, they've put together the POE certification program. And these are the symbols that you can see on the right hand side. So the the aim of this is to validate the IEEE 802.3 interoperability. Um, and to understand this, the, the box on the left with the red arrow going to the green box, uh, that indicates um, it's a powered device. So this is a device that's being connected into and onto the powered system. Uh, on the right hand side, you've got the red arrow going away from the green box. So this is the PSE, the um, the equipment providing the power. And so to understand this, um, the, the PSE number uh, must exceed the number on the PD. So in this example here, you've got a, a three for the PSE, a one for the PD. Uh, so, okay, three is greater than one, excellent. The, that indicates that there is more power available uh, from the PSE than the PD requires. Fantastic, that's good to go. So it's simple thing to, to look at, and this is being adopted by more and more manufacturers to try and get away from the VHS Betamax kind of uh, analogy and to unify um, the industry going forward. So what are the applications for POE? Um, the biggest push, as I mentioned, is commercial lighting uh, and LED lighting, um, particularly important for hotels, big offices, etc. Um, as it's easy to implement, you've then got full centralised control and also remote control capabilities. Uh, you also have control systems that can link into POE, the HVAC controls, air quality, occupancy sensors, uh, the world of smart thermostats, the, the shades and the blinds that we demonstrated earlier, and the, the whole expanding uh, range of IoT, Internet of Things devices that are coming through. And what are the benefits for the end user? Well, there's a huge amount of energy efficiency. Um, it's estimated that 30 to 40% of savings can be made. There's ease of deployment, so you've got the one cable delivering uh, the data and also the power, which results in reduced capex. Um, also, the integration into BMS systems, the amount of data harvesting um, for, for what's going on in the building, um, which OK, can lead in turn to, uh, to to the concerns that we have about the, the amount of data that is being harvested and leading to offsite uh, offsite servers and increased cloud uh, usage, which uh, have their own energy efficiency issues therein. But that's also being addressed by a redesign and reallocation of sites for um, server farms and being able to, to use the excess heat to, to provide heating to adjoining buildings. So that's getting addressed further down the line, but I digress. Um, also error notification, uh, it allows for enhanced uh, FM uh, response capability. And it's also important to note that POE is also being heavily uh, adopted by car manufacturers already. Uh, there's many connected devices um, and powered devices within a vehicle, and POE has been seen as a very useful for solution uh, for uh, manufacturers. There's also a lot, uh, a lot of potential in the domestic sphere. Uh, there's the potential for perhaps the dual wiring system. So you have the, the classic 230 volts AC for high powered devices, your ovens, your hobs, your showers, your electric vehicles, etc. But potentially uh, POE circuits for everything else, your connected controllable lighting, uh, your smart heating controls, your security, your connected TVs uh, and all your device charging, as I mentioned before. Um, there's increased safety for the occupant. There's, there's safe touch voltage. There's a reduced fire risk, reduced failure of componentry. And again, the energy efficiency is massively increased. You've heard in previous presentations, us mention about the concept of the prosumer. Um, this is the, uh, the producer and the consumer of energy. And you'll find out a lot more on this through Gary's presentation next Tuesday. But there's really good potential for POE um, linking into this system as well. 
Uh, obviously, if you're generating at DC through your solar voltaic systems uh, built into the roofs, why convert it from DC to AC and then back to DC again? If you could link it, link it in um, to, to then power your DC devices within the property, you then don't have multiple AC, DC, DC, AC, AC, DC conversion losses. Um, so you could start to see that becoming integrated uh, going through as well. And uh, yeah, this leads to potential for integration through off-site manufactured cable solutions. Um, we're seeing seeing growth in this sector, and it's a, it's has many benefits to offer. Um, also, swifter deployment of the cables. Again, one sing single cable for the data and the power, um, less material, etc. And again, drives the energy efficiency uh, of the building, which is going to be so key to addressing our net carbon zero targets. We've got an example here of almost a self-contained prosumer device. This is a, a commercial um, security camera system, uh, but essentially it's the same principle. So here you've got the solar PV, uh, a wireless uh, access point, battery and the outdoor uh, camera. And this is all being driven and connected through uh, a PoE switch. Uh, so no additional power is required um, and we can expand on that here. Uh, again, it's a commercial solution, but on the left, you can see similar sort of setup. You've got the, the solar PV, your battery, uh, your solar controller, your Ethernet switch and an array of cameras. But all these things then need additional power uh, to enable the equipment to operate. On the right hand side, you look at a PoE solution, self-contained. Uh, the power data is being delivered to the end devices and also simple connection through the power to the battery and to the solar. So is it PoE a pipe dream or reality? Well, analysis seems to think that this is coming through and it's going to grow quickly. Uh, we've got uh, a graph here from GM Insights, and this is comparing uh, PoE solutions in the UK uh, from 2018, 2018 figures to 2025 projections. So the figures are in US dollars per million. But we can see industrially in 20, 2015, it sat about $24 million <clears throat> and that's projected in the next five years to increase to 70 million. Commercial, 18 million, increasing to 55 million and residential, 12 million to 50 million. So these are, these are not small numbers uh, and it's, it's showing a rapid increase in, uh, in the power over Ethernet adoption. One of the reasons this could be is linking into the predictive growth of the Internet of Things, the IoT. <clears throat> in 2015, uh, these are global figures, these aren't UK figures, and this graph is from Statista and is current to this year. In 2015, the, uh, there were 15.4 billion IoT devices connected out there, and this is rising, predicted to rise to 75 billion connected devices by 2025. Um, a lot of this can be in part through the Amazon uh, Alexas, your, your connected speakers, etc. And many of these things are using wireless. Um, but for stability and also to alleviate uh, concerns of overuse of uh, radio bands, Wi-Fi, etc., you'll, you'll see more things, especially in new builds, uh, adopting um, wired solutions uh, because they're more stable less interference and uh, less perceived risk to health. Um, so yeah, uh, that's helping to drive the, the PoE projections as well. So I've been a big fan of PoE and the potential that, uh, that it offers. Um, and then recently I've come across uh, yeah, digital electricity uh, by a company called Vault Server. <clears throat> and essentially it's PoE on steroids. Um, gone is your 90 meters uh, constraints limitation. OK, you can up that by the injectors, um, but this enables delivery up to two kilometers of up to a kilowatt per conductor pair safely. Um, the touch voltage is safe, again, inherently safe for, for uh, people to interact with. Not that uh, you would choose to, um, but uh, yeah, th this works by sending energy pulses um, around 700 per second a mixture of energy and data uh, over, you know, like I say, two kilometres to then provide the power and the data at the end. 
Um, through this next slide, slide, we can see that this enables the, the linking in of solar, the grid power, battery backup, sending it um, kilometres away and then being used to, uh, to power various devices, your PoE switches and whatever else you wish to connect into. Um, and importantly, this already conforms to a number of British standards. Um, I'm not going to list them here, but uh, yeah, it, it's already compliant with uh, many of the ICT and telecoms and audiovisual uh, capabilities. Um, and yeah, there, there's such serious potential for future works here, particularly in the prosumer and the and the generation uh, renewable generation uh, side of things. So we can couple the on-site generation, energy storage, all the way through to endpoint usage. So uh, yeah, we'll we'll be watching this closely and uh, and and providing more information as uh, as we find out more. But yeah, it's uh, yeah some serious disruptive technology coming through. So in summary, I hope I haven't waffled on too long. Um, in summary, the PoE market is exponentially expanding and it's anticipated to do so. Um, there's a, a move towards smarter buildings. The PoE can deliver swifter deployment, as I mentioned, a single cable for power and data. There's lower material costs, less copper. There's lower risk, there's safer systems, 57 volts DC cell. High failure component tree has been removed and centralized. Uh, PoE can address and offer energy efficiency opportunities. And there's fewer transformers for uh, most of the portable equipment, which is very lossy. It's fully addressable smart controls for monitoring devices and the potential for integration into the prosumer model with no to low losses. So there's many new opportunities ahead for electrical contractors and PoE is definitely one to keep an eye on. And that is the end of my presentation. So uh, thank you very much for listening and uh, over to you, Mike. OK, thank you, Luke. That was um, that was fascinating. Um, just sort of open that up to the um, technical guys in the background. We've got Gary and Shahid. Um, Gary, is there any questions you want to sort of pick up on or um, highlight? Yeah, uh, thanks for that, Luke. Um, sorry, what did you say? There was a, a, a prosumer presentation next Tuesday at 11 o'clock. I a, think so, and apparently it's one you shouldn't miss. Fabulous plug, thanks for that. Um, especially I, I, you. <laughs> yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll try not to. Um, yeah, you mentioned all the billions of appliances and products that are already connected in. Um, uh, certainly this isn't my field, but do you see POE as a, as a real market? Is it a big market? Uh, yeah, I think I think the slides and the projections you saw in some of the graphs there uh, demonstrate uh, that already. Um, yeah, it, it's increasing exponentially. Um, obviously, a uh, big push at the moment has been through uh, PoE lighting, um, but manufacturers uh, start to see the advantages and the take up uh, through a whole plethora of other devices as well. The the sheer connectivity, the the energy saving uh, that can be delivered as well. Yeah, it offers. A wealth of opportunities out there and this is for, for people like our members i'm guessing not plumbers or not roofers this is this is electrical territory it's electrical territory um obviously um yeah it, it's low voltage work but uh yeah it feeds directly into what our members are doing and it's certainly something they should be interested in uh in looking at uh, it's it's another source of work and it's an expanding industry um, yeah, I think you'll see a big demand through uh, clients and specifiers um, for this sort of work going forward. And uh, uh, probably the wrong place to ask this question, but do, do we do you have any plans to produce any guidance for, for ECA members? Uh, yeah, we've been working. Uh, we're part of a European group called, called Europe on. They used to be uh, AIE uh, and we've been working on a very good guidebook, um, which we uh, are in the final throes of uh, putting together. Uh, so we hope for that to be out uh, in the next few months. And as soon as that's available, we'll uh, make that known to members. OK, and um, sorry, one, one final question, if you don't mind. Uh, what What is the capital of Botswana? <laughs> no, I'm only joking. Um, <laughs> it, it, again, a silly question from a sort of a novice in this field. What, 
where do I go to find any info from manufacturers? I, 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 I wouldn't know where to start on that. What's the, is there any leaders, I suppose? Uh, yeah. Um, used to provide the uh, the main processes for uh, many iPhones uh, in the past. They're working with a number of manufacturers out there uh, for the hardware. Obviously, I wouldn't go directly for them uh, to them because they, uh, I think, they're involved in high level development. But uh, you've got uh, Genesis um, and Signify, which was uh, and still is, I think, an arm of, of Philips. Uh, they're leading in that field. Um, I. Pretty sure Legrand have got PoE lighting systems coming out soon as well, if they're not available already. Uh, but yeah, there, there's a number of key key manufacturers out there uh, providing these solutions already. Uh, Gabaron, by the way, Botswana. Ah. Yeah, I mean, you knew that, that obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, there's a question come in from, uh, for, from Tim. Can you run a 55 inch TV on PoE? Quite possibly. Obviously, it depends on um, on the power consumption of that TV. There are TVs, uh, PoE TVs, which have been demoed in uh, some of the trade fairs in Japan over the past couple of years um, th through using splitter devices. Uh, so you can then split out data if it's not uh, inherently PoE enabled uh, and the power consumption is less than 57 watts. You could use uh, how consumption is less than 100 watts and uh, can operate on less than 57 volts, then you could use a splitter, uh, run the PoE to it and then split it out to its uh, DC, uh, DC requirements and then the powered solution for it. So yes, um, and lots of the TVs now actually use an external DC power supply. So that would be possible, but do do check on the um, on the polarity of your DC connector and also the power requirements. So yeah, that is possible, and there have been a number of DIY projects out there. Um, um, another question that's popped in. I'm guessing the answer is the the manufacturers. Uh, where would you go for training? Uh, yeah, the manufacturers are uh, obviously a good source uh, of, of training for that. There's a number of smart um, smart equipment organisations out there, so it may be worth tying in with them. Um, but yeah, the manufacturers are always a, a good place to go to to get their uh, their specific requirements. Uh, sorry, it, it's actually a 60 inch TV apparently from the question. Some of these people have got far, far bigger TVs <laughs> than me, I must say. <laughs> Oh dear. Uh, yeah, again, now, so it's, Gary it's, Luke, yes. Um, just, I just want to pick up on one of the questions that was uh, that was had been asked during the presentation. That was from Robin about um, in, in terms of bundles of cables and temperature rise, which um, certainly we've had uh, significant issues in the past um, in, in terms of basically moulding a, a bundle of cables on a tray somewhere. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to pick that up in terms of um, installation practice and um, temperatures and bundles. Um, Do you want to make, want to yeah, make a comment? Yeah, you, uh, t a 10 degree rise is permitted um, in cabling. Obviously, the larger larger the core, the the um, the better it's going to be at uh, yeah at reducing. Uh, thermal overload. Uh, so that's why we specified earlier on in the in the presentation that uh, category six is the preferred minimum uh, you can run on small ones. Uh, obviously, you've got, got to have considerations uh, for dissipation, so you don't want, want to group multiple cables. You've still got to have uh, the considerations that you would with, with normal cabling uh, and ensure that things aren't tucked away behind insulation, etc. Yeah, you you have also got the 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 limits of ninety meters without the injector, um, but uh, yeah, you you still got the the same considerations to take into account. Yeah, I think um, I think Sorry, it's worth God. pointing out that we um, we've been involved uh, with a number of um, BSI um, committees, and Tim Aldershaw represents um, the ECA on a number of those. I think TCT seven point two I think deals with installation requirements and cabling um, and I believe um, bundling of cables and um, 
all sort of um, installation type requirements were considered last year. So we have got some reports, and if if you are a member, Robin, the um, the um, reports from those technical committees should be available to you. But if, if you want some more specific advice, then come back to us, and I'll uh, I'll get back to you on that. It's also worth pointing out that um, the the cabling support requirements of seven six seven one. Uh, are universal. They cover every type of cable, not just um, power cable. So it, it it would still need adequate support in and pre prevention against premature collapse, especially in uh, in high risk areas as well. Exactly. Yeah. So th these are things that uh, yeah, if, if people are looking into the world of POE, they do still need a, an aware of of those things. A couple of questions have come in for, for you as well on this one, Luke. Um, the, the standards that this should be installed to, 50174 and 6701? Uh, yes. Um, yeah, you've got a 501 standards, there's one, two, and three. Uh, and yes, it would, uh, yeah, they're, they're the ones that you'd need to need to conform to. And can you chain, uh, sorry, can you daisy chain multiple devices on one cable? Or do you need a single cable per PD? Uh, no, you can uh, you can run these in series as long as the total uh, power demand of all the devices is less than uh, the hundred watts, which is uh, ninety watts, which is available. So yeah, in the normal calculations would uh, would apply with that. And uh, Robin's also put a comment in. I was thinking of reusing existing cabling. Um, is, is it? I'm guessing it's worth checking out what that existing cabling is to make sure it's adequate. Yes, I mean obviously if it's a, it's a very old um, category of cable, uh, you may not have the uh, the, the capabilities uh, within within that for um, yeah uh, covering the, the the power and the ampage uh, that's allowed. So it may be doable, but yeah, you'd have to do uh, do an assessment in each case for that. Mm -hmm. Same as you would do with any electrical installation, really. Exactly, and also check that the cable hasn't any any damage anywhere. You have any others? No, that's all the ones that have been published so far. But what we what we tend to do with these is we'll collate them and answer them uh, if there's any have been missed. Uh, but also members have got access to the ECA's technical helpline, the, the the usual number they can always call in and have a chat with us about this or keep their eye out for any future guidance if they have any questions on on this or any other subject really. Good stuff. OK, if we've not got any more questions, um, but we'll certainly deal with any if you want to email us, you think of something afterwards, then, then get in contact and um, we'll certainly answer your questions. It's um, it's a topic that's not going away. Um, it, it, it's something that's really going to take off, I think. Uh, in the States, they've seen a massive increase in the uptake of um, POE lighting, uh, and they're expecting that to um, to grow even more. So it's something that's coming. Uh, I think we need to be aware of it. Um, yeah, so have it on your horizon. So thank you all for um, partaking today. It's been an interesting one. And um, next week, we have what, Gary? Oh, the prosumer electrical installation, which uh, is, a, is a word not that familiar to many, but other than POE, is possibly going to be the biggest change to the electrical industry for the next 10 or 15 years. So 11 o'clock Greenwich Mean Time, if, uh, if you're available, please do join in. OK, thank you. Um, thank you, everybody, for taking part. It's um, it's time to leave it for another week. Um, as I say, we've got uh, another interesting one coming up next Tuesday. So in the meantime, keep well, keep safe. And uh, I, I presume you're all looking forward to walking out to the park to meet your one other person that you can speak to. So enjoy. <laughs> thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you.